This is the future. Evolution. This is the future. Hello my fellow Dream Chasers, uh, Kenzie Bradshaw here for those that are familiar to my channel and uh, to our fellow Disney fans here for the very first time and welcome to the first episode of a brand new series on my channel Kingdom of Isolation. Yes, I know it's Frozen lyrics and I know you're sick and tired of Frozen but leave me be! Circumstances have forced my hand. Anyway, uh, but yeah, with me uh, is uh, another big Disney fan uh, as well. It is uh, B Parkinson Cameron, say hi to the people! Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, was, yeah. Uh, I'm talking to her through um, uh, Facebook Messenger because we had we've been having technical issues to try and get this up and running uh, this evening, but uh, we're good to go now. And uh, basically, how does this Kingdom of Isolation series work, Kenzie? I hear you all asking. Well, basically, we're going to be reviewing Disney films, but it's the animated Disney films. Pixar ain't included, live action ain't included. Those will be for a separate run, and with how and judging with and judging by how many uh, uh, films Disney have made, live action, Pixar, and animated. Oh boy, this is gonna go. This is gonna be going for a few years at least. Uh, considering I'm gonna try and do <laughs> one. Considering I'm gonna try and do one episode a week, uh, and possibly have different guests every week as well. Uh, but anyway, enough jibber jabber about what's going on, how the series works. Um, uh, for those familiar with my reviews, uh, I've got four categories uh, for uh, to, to talk about regarding these reviews. Story, characters, visuals, and the soundtrack. Uh, the visuals, that could be anything from like uh, the animation style, the editing, the, the, the visual effects, whatnot. Uh, but there's a fifth category. Uh, there's, there's a fifth topic for these Disney reviews. Test of time or legacy. How well they hold mm -hmm. up today. And... Considering we're start, considering this is the very first episode, we thought let's go right back to the beginning and go through the very first animated Disney film that was ever made, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, December twenty first, nineteen thirty seven. Eighty three years ago, that was when we had our first full length animated Disney film, and who'd have thought Disney would become the juggernaut it is today? So, yeah, um, uh, the re reason for me starting this series is because Disney Plus launched in the UK um, on Tuesday, uh, March 24th, uh, so in honour of that, I figured, yeah, let's, let's review the Disney films. I mean, I mean, the next three weeks are going to fly in for me, considering, considering we're on lockdown at the moment, but anyway, um... Let's get into this. Right, the story, a very good, very good place to start with. Uh, based on the fairy tale of the uh, the Brothers Grimm. Uh, so yeah, you've got the evil queen, jealous of Snow White's beauty. And, um, I mean, I mean, I mean, jealousy, Disney, uh, evil queen, uh, what, evil parent figure, jealous of princess's beauty. I mean, what else is new? <laughs> what else is new in Disney's catalogue? <laughs> I mean, well, to be fair, it was the beginning of the whole sort of thing, so they might as well start with, with something like that. Although I do find it very interesting that the adaptations that have followed on since then have mm -hmm. followed more of the Disney movie than they did of the original story, which is kind of says a lot about Disney, really, with the fact that even, even just five, ten years after the movie had come out, before Disney had really become the giant corporation it is now, mm -hmm. it was still so influential to ballet companies to dance recitals to basically everything yeah that that is that is a very interesting point there um but yeah um so yeah uh while watching while watching the film there were a lot of things that i um that i was uh, taking note of like uh, the pros cons and uh i only had one particular point in the um uh in the in my notes uh which was uh middle of the road oh um forgot to put up the spoiler alert if you've somehow not seen the film yet but i mean 
Disney fans, we've pretty much seen all the animated films at this point. Um, I, was like, I forgot to put the spoiler alert uh, in there if you've still not seen it. Uh, just, but I, just, just playing safe in case there's someone that still hasn't seen any of these animated films. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, um, uh, the Evil Queen dresses Snow White up as um, Scullery Maid, but even but even that doesn't hide. Um, Snow White's uh, true beauty, and uh, it's very it's, it's interesting to it's interesting to see that um, interesting from uh, looking at the bigger picture of this, the fact that uh, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what um, doesn't matter what background you have as long as as long as you as long as you're being nice to people. I mean. Something along those lines. I, I mean, I, I found it interesting in the story um, mm -hmm. when I was watching it back that, yeah. in actual fact, it's not her physical beauty that actually draws the prince in the first place. It's her voice, which was never really something that was kind of covered off because they covered off about her ebony hair, her lips, and all Lip. of these other physical yeah. beauty features. But it's actually yeah. her voice, her expression of her soul that draws the prince mm -hmm. in over the wall. Which, if yeah. you think about it, is something that was mentioned in Sleeping Beauty because uh -huh. that was. What that were given to her, but it was never covered off with um, with that in the movie for Snow White, which I did find rather interesting because oh. the most iconic thing about her as a person is actually her voice. There we and go. And all of these sorts of things, that's what's most iconic. Yeah. Um, anything else. I mean, again, I'm talking from the perspective of a Snow White cosplayer as well. The voice is, is everything. I mean, I mm -hmm. can't sing, but even when I'm out as Snow, my voice when I speak, is higher and lighter and it's kind of softer and it's got that specific quality to it and that initially was what drew him in. Like, he could have peeked over the wall and seen that she looked like an ugly hag and he probably still would have been interested because it was her voice and her expression of herself through her voice and the singing. Yeah. And the, it was very hopeful and it was very mm -hmm. beautiful in itself. Yeah. That, yeah, so, I mean, well, that that's a very interesting perspective there. Uh, now that you've um, mentioned all that, but um, but yeah, and then once all that, then once all that's out of the way, uh, you, then you've got, and then you have the the queen telling the huntsman to go and kill Snow White um, by taking her into the forest, picking some flowers, and then uh, killing her. Um, the, what are the things that? What are the thing? As th this is one of the first cons. That I found in this film, uh, the fact that uh, she says uh, during that scene, "You know the penalty if you fail." We never find out what that penalty is, and when the queen finds out that it's actually a pig's heart in that box instead of Snow White's heart, we never actually see the Snow White, the Huntsman, getting punished anyway. I mean, we don't see it directly, but it's one of those sorts of things that's kind of implied based on everything else that we see when she's doing her spell and when she's freaking out the crow and even when she goes out from the palace and she's got yeah. that, the, the skeleton there um, from somebody previously. So we can kind of... I mean, you could look at it as it's a con because it's not there, but you could also look at it as it's a case that what she would do to him would be so horrific... Leaving yeah, it, it up to the leaving it up to the audience's imagination. Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. I mean, again, I'm a I'm a writer as well in my in my spare time. Um. So sometimes the best thing you can do is leave little clues and tidbits here and there, but Ooh. leave it for the audience to kind of infer it themselves. And that is also very age appropriate to do that because child young children will make up their own mind and see it their own way, and adults will see it their own way as well. And it can be different, and yeah. it can be just as horrifying as you want it to be or as not so bad and maybe like a light slap of the wrist but if you throw it all in their faces you're not giving them the opportunity to think about it and they're not really fully engaging with the movie they're more just watching it and you kind of want them to engage i mean that's what kind of has helped disney's reputation across the years is because their movies draw you in and you become involved in it as you watch it Well, that's, well, I'll say, I mean, let's put it this way. Right now, couldn't ask for a better first guest to be able to give their perspective <laughs> on their, on things. So, and that, and that's why, that's why with, with these, um, with this series, I'm, I'm going to try and get 
a guest in every week to be able to talk about these things. And then we get to, oh, and then we get to, oh my word, this scene, de definitely, definitely nightmare fuel. The whole forest sequence, Snow White running through the forest and you just, the, the whole environment just looks very intimidating. Oh yeah. Definitely, it's nightmare fuel for sure. Um, even just the 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 logs, like alligators on the wall. Yeah. Um, yeah, stuff like that was just absolutely, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but I like the fact that the forest itself changes throughout. So it's almost like you could say it was a physical journey, but you could also say it was more of a metaphysical journey as well. Yeah. Because when she goes through all of that, it's awful and it's terrible, but it's not the same forest that she started out in, and it's not the same forest that she ends in. Um, so I found that really, really interesting. But again, the, the small details and the small features of it, like all the eyes everywhere and just how claustrophobic it felt, um, it was really, really well-managed uh, scene. One of the most sinister parts of the movie, because I don't know if you noticed this, but there is yeah. a lot in this movie that is actually very very sinister and if you look at disney as it is now you know mm -hmm. taking the mick out of itself a little bit more lighthearted and fun versus disney then disney then was not messing around yeah that was sinister at times it was very it, it, i suppose in a way it kind of reflects how our society has changed in terms of what we give to our children and what we want our children to see and you know the whole thing about is it PC is it not PC like if so yeah. white as it was then was tried to put out in the cinema now it wouldn't get anywhere I don't think it would yeah and and of course but... it, would be, it would not be um, a U it would definitely be a PG at least <laughs> yeah and of course bearing in mind folks that was back in 1937 and they were doing that sort of stuff and that's and that got a and that got a U rating from British Board of Film Classification. And like B said, if that was done today, that would be PG right out of the gate. Sure, for sure. Yeah, but then, but then it's, but, see, but the editing and the music at that point, uh, uh, at that point, it's just, it's on point. Just how well done from an animation point of view how well done that whole sequence was put together. The editing, the visuals, the music, and then just the big climax, and then she just collapses, and you're just like, yeah, I'm definitely not going to sleep tonight. Thanks, Disney! <laughs> but, yeah. Well, she sure manages to get to sleep later on that night, luckily for her. Um, if only we all had that same fortitude. <laughs> yeah, uh, and... And that and that and that takes us very nicely into the very next scene where, where she ends up put, going into this um, sm the, with a smile and a song, uh, sequence, um, sing singing with the animals, and I managed to get I managed to get a life message out of that song there, uh, just singing or doing something enjoyable when things get tough. Yeah. Again, whistle while you work. Oh, oh yeah the yeah the yeah um was it? We'll, we'll get in we'll get into that one shortly um and then you've got um and then the music um the music when the animals are leading snow white to the um uh to the dwarf's cottage the music there i was sitting there big smile on my face just it was this sense of adventure with that mm with with her heading to the cottage for the first time yeah i mean and it was it was such a contrast like it was a ridiculous contrast between the scene that we had before and yeah. the thing that i like as well is as she's getting her emotions out and mm -hmm. she's crying on the floor yeah the nightmare fades as her emotions you know as she works through the emotion and it's kind of like a they're at the same time and then it fades out, and then we see all these lovely animals just like, oh, yeah. oh hello, and then everything's all hunky-dory and everything's back together again. Um, and I just love how even when she's following the animals, there's a, she's bright and she's cheerful about it, but there is kind of like a bit of a hesitation, like, mm, should I, should I not? <laughs> um, and then she gets she gets over it, and she follows them. She trusts animals because, yeah. you know, I mean, it's a human thing to trust animals. 
sometimes we trust animals more than we trust other people because animals don't generally have sinister intentions. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially when somebody that she obviously trusted, that being the huntsman, was just like, yeah, I'm going to kill you. And she's like, oh, no. And he's like, oh, maybe not. You're too much of a babe. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's B not being technical now. That's B just being B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, babe, I'm not going to stab you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then, and then you mentioned just a couple of, couple of moments ago the Whistle While You Work. A small poem going into the song itself and then some of the actions that we see Snow White and the animals carry out. Some of the actions, like like uh, it's a couple of squirrels, I think it is, uh, sweeping the dust under the rug in time with the music. Oh, it's the squirrel. I think it's a squirrel who goes up to the top and um, wraps the cobwebs round the tail. Yeah. Um, and then and then the brushing and when they're doing the brushing and everything. And you yeah. know what? The brushing is actually a sound in the song. Ah. Like the brushing's actually found in the song because it's got and the, they do that. They incorporate the actions of the animals, but the noises that they make doing the activities is kind of built into the song. Oh, for for the, for the for the sound design, yeah. Yeah, it makes it very clever and it makes it more, it seems more realistic. Like, I don't know about you, but uh -huh. with some of the Disney movies, I'm not going to mention them, uh, with a couple of them, it's just like, oh, and here, insert song time. Um, especially for some of the direct to uh, DVD or direct to video sequels. It was oh. just like, oh, and here's the song time. Yeah. But in this one, it felt natural. Yeah. Like the song felt natural. It felt mm -hmm. like the right thing to do. Absolutely. It wasn't just, oh, we've got to put the song in here because it's a kids' movie. It felt mm -hmm. perfectly right for her to sing. Yeah. yeah. And and don't worry, folks, I will do the direct to video um, films as well. Don't worry about that. We'll get to them soon. <laughs> but uh, yeah, all the Whistle While You Work sequence. That's out of the way now. Then we get introduced to the dwarfs for the very first time. Uh, mm. I mean, I mean, massive pro right out of the gate. The names fit the personalities of the characters perfectly. But oh, yeah. but what what am I? Uh, I, was like, I was like, this this is probably me just being this is probably me just being nitpicky at this point. But um, Doc. Um, because there was a there was a special feature at the end of the VHS release back in the nineties um, of Snow White where they actually went behind the scenes on how they made Snow White after the film, and mm -hmm. um, and Walt said Doc, self appointed leader of the group, is it me or does Doc have speech issues? Is it me or does the Doc have speech issues? Uh, I say, like I say, I know that sounds like me being a bit nitpicky uh, at this point, but. Um, does he actually have speech issues, or is that part of his character? Well, I'm not entirely sure, because my interpretation of it was he only really kind of had those sort of speech issues because he was just like, oh, this is a really attractive woman here. Um, she's really, really nice, and I don't quite know what oh. to do. Um, or, like, later on, he, he kind of has that blah, 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 when he's stressed. So I think it might be something that's kind of tied to his emotional state more than like oh. a more than like an actual thing character trait, yeah. Character, um, but you're totally right with the dwarves. I mean, some of them are just absolutely hilarious. How how they're so much like each other. Like even Bashful when he kind of like yeah you know, pulls his shoulders in a wee bit and then starts <laughs> fiddling with his beard and grumpy. Oh my! Oh God. my word! <laughs> He's the only one of them that even even wears red, and he's like the only one that's like fully in red. He's like me. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not doing this. No. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> they, they were they were so on point. Yeah. But the best thing about them as well is they were very approachable, and you yeah. could you could look at them and you could look and say that's a family. Like it didn't Absolutely. just feel like these are dwarves that work in a mine together. They mm -hmm. felt as if they were more than that. It felt like they were brothers. Yeah, because um because um. She, Snow White does ask the animals about whether the um, uh, the, the the dwarfs uh, she doesn't know they're the dwarfs at the time uh, if they have uh, parents or if they're they're orphans. Yeah, and, I mean, well, it's a natural question to ask, really, especially yeah. when you're looking and see the beds and you're like, oh, these are for kids. <laughs> yeah, you say, and, and and then and then starting to delve a little deeper, and then and then it's this case that and then the penny drops. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. For, for, for 
for sure, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, then the Hi Ho song as well. <laughs> but it's it, uh, the Hi Ho one is another one where the sound of their actions is yeah. part of the song because in the beginning with the like tinkering noise. Yeah. It's when they're still hitting hammer on the diamonds. Yeah. Um. So that was again another part of how the sound was connected to the yeah. song. It wasn't just a random song. So I think that kind of applies for all of them. They feel natural because yeah. they're actually properly built into the story. Mm -hmm. They're built into the visuals. They're built into the sound in general. It's all part of the package. Yeah. And then I think, um, let's say, sticking with the dwarves um, for a moment, um, let's say, later on in the film, Grumpy, um, the, the way he talks about um, uh, the, the Queen and... Uh, what not. Grumpy foreshadowing future events in the film. How's about that? Yeah. I mean, I suppose you could turn around and say that's basically every cynic ever. Because <laughs> they're so cynical that they expect it. Yeah. He did, he warned them all. And, you know, the rest of them were like, oh, no, it'll be fine, 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 with a care-happy attitude and that. But he's like, no, we're underestimating her. Although the question I do have to ask... Yeah. It, like, is there a backstory to that whole thing? Is there a reason why Grumpy knows what she's like? Is there a reason that he's looking at her and like, guys, she's going to do this? Yeah. Because that... even when he's leaving later on, he turns around and says to Snow, he's like, very, very clearly, just don't do this. Yeah. Um, because he, he, he knows that the Queen, he knows the type of person the Queen is. So I don't know if there's maybe a bit of a backstory there. There's yeah. maybe a specific reason Grumpy knows. Or it could just be a case of Grumpy's actually the most intelligent of all of them and the most perceptive of all of them, realistically. I was about to mention, how do the dwarves know about the Queen? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't really covered off, but yeah. You know. um, that's one thing that I can say that the other adaptations and stuff later on yeah. um, delved into. They really kind of delved into, you know, how people knew about the Queen and how the Queen kind of came to be a Queen. Um, because yeah. at that point, it wasn't really like it touched on the wicked stepmother thing, yeah. but it wasn't as big a thing as, say, for example, it was in Cinderella. Like it was abundantly clear in Cinderella, whereas with Snow yeah. White, it's not, it's not so much. Like you don't kind of see the connection between the two of them. Yeah, absolutely. As, as you do between Cinderella and Lady Tremaine, um, yeah. who, by the way, she gets really sinister in the sequels. Like I'm just putting that out there. Like, whoa, <laughs> you need to have a chill pill, woman. Um, <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. She really does. I'm just like, geez. <laughs> Some of these early, early villains are just so petty. Like, think about everything that happens in Snow White. Everything she goes through is literally just because she looks nicer than the Queen. And the Queen's like, yep, yeah, beauty is everything in life. But, you know, she's slightly nicer than me. So, oh, no, I'm going to go kill her. I mean, could you imagine that actually happening in our world nowadays? Somebody flicking through Instagram and goes, she's better looking than me. I'm going to go get an ex. Oh, that <laughs> is just... I mean, you just, you just got to think, really? I know, it's just so... It's, it, funnily enough, that is the most unrealistic thing about this entire movie, to me. That is the most unrealistic thing. Never mind the communicating with animals and all these sorts of things. No, 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 no. The fact that she's just like, you know what? I'm going to ruin this person's life and kill her because she looks prettier than me. I mean, oh, I mean come on. Seriously, let your hair out. Come on, we don't see your hair at any point. Just take the crown off and take off that big white headband thingy that you've got on your heat. Let us see your hair. Maybe then everybody will be like, yeah, she's pretty. Look at her hair. She's wearing it down today. It looks great. <laughs> you know, don't stay completely buttoned up. Maybe you just got to be a little bit looser and everyone's like, yeah, she's nice. Oh, yeah. no. But um, I do find it interesting how it's just like, oh, she's evil. She's evil. She's evil. And then later on, as you mentioned, when she finds out that Snow is still alive, it's just like, ah, what did you just do? <laughs> like, her evil level goes from, like, 7 to, like, 10,000, like, so quickly. Just like that. No. <laughs> just like, lady, lady, get a grip. Get a yeah. therapist while you're at it. You clearly <laughs> need one. Yeah. And then... <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, we're on about the dwarves here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, well, they, I would say my favorite dwarf out of the out of the seven 
it's got to be dopey. He's just he's just this big beaming smile, so carefree. But something I can't quite get my head round. Uh, uh, d- as I um, for those for those that are familiar with my Everything Wrong with Tom and Jerry series, uh, we'll know we'll know uh, we'll know how nippy I, nitpicky I can be with those uh, with the Tom and Jerry episodes. Uh, but anyway, the thing the thing here um, with Snow White, great mother figure throughout the f- uh, when she's living with dwarfs. By the way, folks, um, the they smell the soup that she's cooking. Dopey puts his head through the staircase banished or whatever it is he he get he gets it through no problem but yet he can't seem to get it out hey have you ever seen those photos of dogs getting their heads stuck it happens like, <laughs> that's realistic but it's uh, such a childish thing to do like he is everything about him is just so childish and he is he's like a child um and that i think that kind of helps with why you're endeared towards him because he is he's like a toddler yeah. Um, like, even when he goes to get the soap, and he's like, oh, 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 and he's trying to catch this soap flying yeah. everywhere. And, and, then, and, then, he ends, and then he ends up swallowing the soap. I know, right? And then he's like, oh, he's oh dear. He's his own clothes when he's trying to walk. Like, he face palms. Like, he hits the deck at least five times. <laughs> I never complain. He just gets back up again, like, yeah, it's all okay. It's all good. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, to, I mean, to quote, to quote the Black Knight from Monty Python, nope, tis but a scratch. <laughs> I know, it's just like, nah, it's, it's fine. I've had worse. You should have seen me last Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Grumpy, brought, Grumpy brought some Bucky from these, uh, from these monks in Scotland. It was not a very nice evening. I woke up the next morning and my head was stuck in a trash can. I have no idea where the trash can came from because you know medieval period but hey it was there my head was in it <laughs> yeah and then anyway and then continue. yeah and then once and then once all that's um uh out of the way um once once all that's out of the way the the soup they, they go to they go to wash uh thanks to snow white telling them to wash uh, i mean how did they get away with this an innuendo in 1937 do we wash where it doesn't show an innuendo in 1937. What's all that about? They snuck that one in when Walt wasn't looking. He was on his coffee break. And they went, right, guys, get it in now. <laughs> yeah. He won't know about it until afterwards, and then it's too late. <laughs> yeah. You'll see. And then, and then you've got, uh, and then there's a there's a couple there's a couple of other there's a couple of other side notes uh, that I that I put down as well. Um. Uh. When. Uh. Going. Back a little bit earlier into the film, when they find out that uh, the lights are on in their house, um, and they they see Jiminy crickets. Now I don't know if now I don't know if I don't know if that was a I don't know if that was an old saying for something else back then, or whether that was foreshadowing Pinocchio three years later. Uh, I don't know. Might be both. Yeah. Could be both. Yeah, as, as like I say, not sure. I say not sure what the Jiminy Crickets would have meant back then. Um, but um, hey ho. Um, but then maybe uh, Holy Hera. I mean, Disney has a reputation for doing that. Like they'll take like a phrase like "Oh my golly gosh" or whatever, and they'll change it into something relevant to to that. So I yeah. don't know if maybe that was if they had already kind of had. Um, uh, had Pinocchio lined up, but I mean, like in Hercules, they do that instead of saying like "Holy hell," they go "Holy Hera." Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, I was like, yeah. Oh, anyway, we're not gonna get into Hercules because that's like, a whole other review, and that one will be amazing. I say, I say, I say, I say, I say, I say that's that's during probably the best period Disney ever had, the Disney Renaissance. Uh, but we'll get into that at some point later down the road. However long that takes, we don't know. But um, but yeah. Um, but, uh, there, there was a deleted scene, uh, going back to the, uh, behind the scenes of making Snow White, um, they had animated the, um, they had animated this sequence, but, um, they never actually fully animated it, like, putting the colour in, they, they had all the, they had all the drawings, they had the music, they had the, the dialogue, they had all that, they just didn't have the, the colour in it uh the deleted scene music in your soup that was mm-hmm. i said that was a song that as much as they as much as everyone liked uh the sequence 
they felt it wasn't essential for the story. 10 out of 10, 100%. I don't know if it is, but 100% 10 out of 10 would confirm more than likely Disney will have reused that for one of the later movies. Because they did that. They were really, really... Like, um, Second Star to the Right um, in Peter Pan yeah. contained um, uh, some of the songs and um, notes from Alice in Wonderland. And the ah. song that they, were they, they reuse everything. Disney do not waste anything. Like they absolutely do not waste anything. They've even reused drawings and stuff several times. And if you look close enough, yeah, they have. They have. They have done that. They have done that. Yeah. So they'll have used that somewhere else. I'm not sure where because I've not seen the scene myself. But I can bet. I'm willing to bet money on it. Yeah, because because they they. they, they... Um, uh, Robin Hood was a was a perfect example of that. Yes. Um, re reusing animation from things like uh, Jungle Book, Aristocat, and even Snow White at one point. Yes, 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 yes. That's the one. Couldn't yeah. remember which one it was that was like the glaring example of it. But yes, you're right. Um, and if you think about it, in Robin Hood, I mean, the Jungle Book stuff does kind of make sense because they literally had the same guy voicing the bear. Phil Harris, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, both of them. So you know, it's just gonna went. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then and then once all that's out of the way, we and then once all that's out of the way, the washing that they've had the soup. Um, the interesting thing here is that the dwarfs put Snow White before themselves as far as the sleeping arrangements were concerned. Yes, 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 yes. Because they're all in the, they, they all sleep in like the cupboards and the drawers and everything. Although I yeah. do love how the drawers, um, the doors in the cupboard drawers and stuff are moving when they snore. Yeah, like <laughs> that was just so clever. But I mean, the fact that they did that with her, like I don't know if that was to highlight exactly how personable Snow White was as a person, or if it was more about the fact that the dwarves were so kind, or if it could be both. Well, I, th well, I, th well, I think from that. I think from all that is the fact that they um, uh, it's a case that they saw how nice she was to them, so it was a case of returning the favor. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah, and then we are essentially into the third act of the film. You've got um, you've got the evil queen transforming into the uh, the old hag to. Take a page out of your playbook from earlier. And, oh my word, maniacal right out the gate. I know, this is what I'm saying. This is the, like, she was 7 out of 10 evil, now she's, like, over 9,000 evil. Yeah. <laughs> it just went so quick. She goes so crazy, so bad, and so evil that the crow is like, no, I'm done. Yeah, she's like, nope, like, hey, nope, I'm out of here. Yeah. yeah, they were just like, hey, it's you, I love you so much. Holy, no, 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 I'm done with this. Like, yeah. He's just like, let me hide behind the skull. <laughs> she has a skull in a ah! random skull in the room. I'm like, fine, yeah. you're a scooby new villain. I mean, come on, just random skull. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but I mean, again, from a technical standpoint, the whole transformation sequence, again, 1937, they had no computers back then. How they animated that entire transformation sequence without computers back then is beggar's belief how well done that is. Like, it still stands up now, all those years later. Exactly. Lifetime later, and this still stands up and looks clean and sharp. It's just, it's, it's, un it's unbelievable. And I just love as well the fact that we saw every element of the translation separately. So we saw, we heard the laugh. We heard the cackling laugh of the old lady. We, we saw the scream and the scream was animated itself, you know, with the vapors going up and, yeah. the, and, and everything. That every single part of it was animated yeah. um, separately. Every single it, part of it was done separately yeah, the, before she took the whole thing. Yeah, the, the, hair, um, the hair changing color, the, the hands yeah. just getting all horrifying. And then, and then you just see the rest of the transformation in the shadow and you're just like, okay, yeah, definitely not messing with her anytime soon. Yeah, and then, then we have the scene coming up, the scene that spawned a thousand memes. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm trying to... It's like three seconds that spawned a thousand memes that will last forever. 
Oh, um, yeah. Uh, which which scene was that again? Oh, that that's that's the one where she's got everything ready and she's cackling yeah. as she goes down through the trap door in the floor. Oh, yeah, yes, that one. Yes, yeah, I've I've, I've seen. A thousand memes for insomniacs the world over. Yep. <laughs> Saying I was going to go yeah. to bed at 10 o'clock, 3 a.m., me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they, I mean, Kingdom Hearts fans would have probably used that meme as well when they were waiting for Kingdom Hearts 3 to come out last year. <laughs> it's just, honestly, just that scene, it's just brilliant. But the, the, the apple as well, like the bit with the apple so yeah. clever, and I love the fact that the, the skull was on the apple in yeah. the way that it was dripping down and the fact that the apple changed its color and everything like that as well yeah. i mean if you think about it realistically mm -hmm. it's actually not too bad a plan the way that she says it. i mean the plan itself is kind of ridiculous but the way yeah. that she kind of puts it across and how she arranges it and everything mm -hmm. it's fairly subtle until she actually gets there but that's another matter entirely yeah um, but it's just it, the sequence is just amazing and mm -hmm. it's just so well done and it, it is sinister like it is really mention how I mentioned earlier that yeah. the sequence when snow is running through the forest is pretty yeah. sinister. This is like that on steroids. Exactly. Like, it's really, really frightening, and you're watching it, and you're just like, a, how did they think it was suitable for children? B, when I was a kid, why did that not terrify the ever living daylights out of me? Is there something wrong with me that that doesn't scare me? That that was me when I was younger. I wasn't I wasn't scared of that stuff back then. But looking back on it now, I'm like. How did I not scared? How did I not get scared by all this? I was not scared of that, but I'll tell you this: I was terrified of Frollo in the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh my word! Yeah. I was a man. No, all the fire and everything. No. Yeah. Well, now that I think about it, they would probably be really good for going out on a date together. I think they would relate to each other quite well. <laughs> You know, it was just like, oh, did you have somebody that you were a guardian for? Yes, yes, I did. You, did you lock them up away so nobody could ever see them? Yes, yes, I did. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's so lovely that we can bond over these things. Are you terrifying beyond all reason? Yes, I'm terrifying beyond all reason. And then Yzma pops up in the background like, excuse me, that's my thing. Oh, <laughs> you know? Anyway, moving away from the chat. <laughs> oh, like dear. Because I'm just so terrible with all my jokes. <laughs> Don't be too surprised if this sort of thing becomes a running gag throughout the series. <laughs> oh, anyway, old ass lady, creepy as hell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then making her. Crows are synonymous with death. Yeah, making and her the way crow to. The crow is terrified by her. Yeah, making death her. Is scared way... of this woman. Yeah, making making her way to the cottage. The the camera focuses on the vultures. The fact that they follow they follow her everywhere she goes, that that to me, brilliant foreshadowing for what's gonna happen during the climax. Yes, yes. Oh, just before you've jumped a wee bit because there's one thing I wanna say. Um, you know how I mentioned earlier about how we didn't see what she did to the huntsman, but it was kind of implied what might have happened. When she's going through, um, and again, listen to the music, it's very slow and plodding and quite sinister yeah. herself. But when she's going through, before she gets in the boat, we see the skeleton of this guy who's been <gasps> in the prison cell. Oh my word! Yeah, and she's just like, oh, you thirsty? Here, have a drink. And she literally boots it into his bones. I have you know, never thought about it like that before. But the fact that the water was just almost within reach. She'd have done that deliberately. This woman is really, really, Freaking really psychopath! And yeah, it's a total, complete other level of cruelty. And the fact that the guy is dead. He's clearly been dead for a very long time. So she's yeah. been doing this for a long time. But she still can't just let him pass. She has to literally kick the water, making a joke into his skeleton and watches his bones fall apart and then cackle like a loony on the way to the boat. I mean, this is a woman who's just like, no. Like, she's just so, so unbelievably evil. And it's just a small sequence, but it means so much yeah. in terms of who, who she is and how flat out awful she is. I mean, if you ever thought for even one second that she could be redeemed, that, I think, is the moment just, where... Just, nope, like, straight out the window after the transformation. Because, yeah, because you could, you could turn around and say, oh, well, you know, the reason, you know, this was just focused on Snow White. She wasn't evil or nasty towards anybody else. This is a clear example that she does this for 
she does this regularly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and the, the, the music throughout the whole sequence when she's going to get to the cottage and just the fact that the way the vultures look at her, like, they're, they're tracking her. They're actually tracking her when she moves. Because their heads don't move that much sometimes. Sometimes it's more their eyes. Like, you know, when they say you're in a portrait gallery, the eyes follow you. It's very much what the vultures are doing. They're tracking her as she goes. Um, and the fact that they pop up again. And again, vultures, they do do that. They they go around the almost like the scent of impending death. So the foreshadowing there with that was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, I'll be totally honest. When she gets to the cottage... I think it's like a bit like a letdown. Like when she gets to the cottage, based on how she's been built up and like super crazy evil. Yeah. The, it's it's not as subtle. It's a little bit too obvious um, when she's when she's at the cottage. Like I would have liked it if it had been a little more subtle, you know, rather than just yeah. here have this apple. It's great. And the fact that she clearly just thinks on her feet as well. She's like, hey, it's a wishing apple. There we go. You didn't take it first time. It's a wishing apple. Yeah, see, get everything you want. You want yeah. a man? Just get you a man. Um, but it's just, it's <laughs> not, it doesn't, for me, just as a criticism, it doesn't feel consistent with the rest of her character. Yeah. Which begs the question, is this transformation an internal thing? Or is this just an external thing? Or what if it's a like, com- or what if it's a combination of the two? It, yeah, because everything that she's ingested into her, along with her intent and everything, you know, is there a chance that it could have changed her about a bit? Because this is a this is a woman who knows what she's doing and she plans everything, and yet when she is there, she's almost like a doddery old woman. Um, and you could say that's part of the act, but even when yeah. Snow's taking the apple, she still continues with that. And she's a victim of her own demise, for sure, but it, it doesn't feel like that. It didn't feel rational. And again, why is she running away from them? <laughs> why does she yeah. run away from the dwarf? She doesn't need to run away from them. She's got no reason to. They're more terrified of her than she is of them. Yeah. Unless, of course, you know, these dwarves are like ninjas in their spare time, and she knows this, and she's like, oh man, I'm going to get smacked down if I don't go. Which again, yeah, just... which again begs the question: How do the dwarves know about the queen? Exactly. I think Grumpy is the reason that they know about her because Grumpy is the one who seems to have the most idea of what she's going to do and how she's going to be. Because oh. they all know, oh, like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And Grumpy, like you know, Grumpy's like three seconds away from grabbing Snow by the shoulders and yelling in her face, "Don't trust anyone but us. She's coming for you." <laughs> Like he, he totally, he totally yeah, is. sounds about right. Sounds about right. Yeah. The one thing, one thing that I would really, really have liked in this movie that wasn't there and is something that I incorporate in my cosplay when I do it, the poison hair comb. The po- Where's my poison hair comb? Oh, yeah. Because that's... Because that's... A poison apple. Yeah. The, the hair comb, yeah, that's mentioned in the book. Mm-hmm. And when I'm actually out as to know why, I mention it as well. I'm just like, oh, I don't really comb my hair very often anymore because last time there was a really lovely one with poison on it. So I don't use yeah. hair combs anymore. I use brushes from a salon. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I would have liked to have seen that because personally, yeah. I think the poison hair comb is a better idea than an apple. She's more likely to use a poison hair comb rather than, hey, here's a really creepy, scary lady that all the animals that I trust implicitly don't like, but I'm going to ignore them because, oh, I'm nice. Hey, she's giving me an apple. Hmm, you know what? I'll just eat it from a total stranger. It doesn't, it's going to make sense. Yeah. So much, but I feel that if they tried with the hair comb, like, I think Snow would have used a hair comb. For sure she would have used a hair comb. Of course. Um. So I would have liked to have seen that as well. Mm-hmm. And I like the fact as well, in the original tale, the original story, yeah. with the poison hair comb um, being included within it, it shows that, you know, this is a relentless woman. This is a woman who will do anything and everything she can yeah. to get what she wants. You know, she doesn't just, like, give up. I mean, in this mm-hmm. movie, you could say, yeah, the huntsman didn't do it, so she's like, fine, I'll do it myself. But yeah. even when it messes up in the story, she still continues to do it herself because she is determined that yeah. no matter what, she is going to kill this woman. 
yeah. she's going to get rid of this rival for <laughs> everything. You know, he's going to completely get rid of her. So I would have liked the hair comb, yeah. personally. But it's not a necessary addition, but I would have liked it, and I felt it would have made it a slightly stronger adaptation if it was in there, along with the apple. Yeah. But, yeah, but, um, I mean, I just... I love the animals, and I love how responsive the animals are, and the fact that the animals start running near enough as soon as they see her, so they don't have to wait for, like, snow to bite the apple. Like, yeah. they, they know, they can tell, and they're just like, no, we need to get the dwarves now, because this, this lady, this old lady is not kosher. Yeah. So they're having to get the dwarves, even before all of this happens. And that in itself kind of adds to the tragedy, because they get there just after Snow has taken the apple. Yeah. Just after she's bit into it. And it's, it's, it's a tragic thing, it's the whole thing. If only they were there a minute earlier. Yeah. If only they'd been able to get there sooner, which is, is, is common for a lot of tragedies, actually, and it's common in a lot of stories. Yeah. Not just Disney ones, but stories in general that followed afterwards that, oh, I was, I just missed it, I, I just missed, you know, mm -hmm. it, it makes it all that sadder if you think if they had moved just a little bit quicker, she wouldn't have eaten the apple. Yeah. Speaking of eating the apple, mm -hmm. very, very much like the fact that we don't see Snow bite it. We don't see snow fall until she's already fallen. So how she feels and how the apple is making her feel, we see the camera is focused on the queen. Yeah. And we hear Snow's voice and how she doesn't feel well, she doesn't feel right. But yeah. we don't actually see it. And that's another thing of, you know, making it more of an engagement rather than just a viewing. because you Leave it to the audience's imagination. Head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You then picture in your head, and again, just that shot of the the hand and the apple falling out the hand. Like, yeah, that's just a brilliant, brilliant shot. I've I've done that myself um, in photos. It's an amazing shot, absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um. So that that was kind of you know, it could have been better, but I think for what it was, especially considering mm -hmm. the fact that this was the first time Disney had done something like this. Yeah. I think it was on the whole generally well executed. Um, Absolutely. But there are a few things that could have been done to kind of improve mm -hmm. it slightly. Yeah. Um, but beautiful shots, mm -hmm. um, some beautiful animation as well. Yeah. Um, and again, just that naivety that mm -hmm. Snow has, the fact that she's such a pure and wonderful person that the thought never even occurs to her mm -hmm. that the Queen could be coming after her. Because she's told by Grumpy, and she's like, "You'll be fine, be fine, be fine." And she never stops to think. The sinister, crazy, scary-looking woman just appearing yeah. out of nowhere, offering me food, mm -hmm. um, just randomly, and being very specific about which apple I have to take. You know, the thought hmm. never occurs to her to be anywhere near suspicious, and she is the one that brings the queen into the cottage. She does it willingly. She doesn't get shanghaied into it. She mm -hmm. does it willingly because she's like, oh, no, 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 the animals are frightened the poor deer. Come on, we'll get you in and we'll get you settled. If she was British, she'd be like, come on, we'll get you a cup of tea and a wee bit of shortbread or something. Yeah. You know, that sort of, that purity of, that innocence of soul, yeah. that, the expression of her soul mm -hmm. is what makes her so beautiful. Not yeah. just the physical elements of how she looks and again this ties in with the fact that the prince was drawn in by how she sounded by the expression of her soul mm -hmm. rather than how she looks and this is another moment where we see that beauty and purity of spirit and soul mm -hmm. but unfortunately it gets used against her um but she never considers not even once does she stop and consider that maybe there's maybe i shouldn't be helping this lady she yeah, just does it without thinking straight away because there is no negotiation for her she's like i need to help her bottom line that's it i need to help her and i feel that for the princesses that followed mm -hmm. this was that i think this is one of those moments that stuck out in terms of the princesses that followed because this is the same quality that a lot of the earlier princesses have um it's that sort of innocence of soul and purity of heart and all these sorts of things i mean as time goes on we get the princesses that kick butt left right and center but <laughs> i feel that was for the earlier princesses this yeah. was very much the quality they kind of went for yeah. um and you know they didn't just use it for marketing purposes snow white was the one that started it all she started the animated disney collection she started the princesses as a thing she yeah. was the blueprint 
she was the basic blueprint for all of the ones that followed. Absolutely. And then as they moved forward across the years, they progressed and they shifted and they became a bit more progressive with the times. Mm -hmm. But the qualities that we are asking young girls to have is that caring. Like that's the sort of quality that we want our children to have. Even back then, we wanted our children to have that quality of care. Absolutely. Um, and, and also, it was a brilliant way to teach stranger danger as well. Yeah. You can be nice and you can be bear, um, caring and considerate and all these sorts of things. Um, but you need to, you know, you need to be careful because there are people out there who will take, try to take advantage. Absolutely. And it's stranger danger without it being highlighted like, this is a stranger. Do not do anything from take stranger. Don't take anything she says. Don't listen to her. Don't have her into the house. It's done subtly. It feels natural. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like the child is being told something. Because I don't know about you, but when you try to tell a kid to do something, especially something as important as that, they never take you seriously. This is a really, really good way to get children to take this seriously. Yeah. Because it feels more organic to them because it's part of the story. And they can even pick it out themselves. Oh, she shouldn't have taken the apple from the creepy old lady. Yeah. The creepy old lady who's probably related to it and Pennywise by the looks of her. Oh, but, boy. Hey, Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. sorry. Continue. This is your review. I'm just talking. <laughs> lads, 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 lads. It's, it's it's great. It's great that you get. It's great to hear your perspective on all these things. Um, uh, there are there are just a, a couple of there are just a couple of other points that I would want to uh, touch on. Um, the uh, during the silly song, uh, Snow White, uh, oblivious to the fact that Dopey is on top of Sneezy until the end of the song, but. From that perspective, I think she was just probably enjoying herself too much to be concerned about anything like that. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, then but then uh, after after the whole um, bite of the apple, collapse of the floor, evil laugh, then I'll be the now I'll be the fairest in the land. It starts raining, and then you just get this huge rush of animals and the dwarves coming in like, There she goes! Let's go get her! And that whole climax, the music, the animation, just the whole storytelling side of things is just... Again, another... another <laughs> again, another, another, great, another great blueprint there on how to do... An exciting climax to a film. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. It had all of the elements that it kind of needed, um, and yeah, the yeah, it, it really did. You know, it had that thrill of the chase and then the lightning yeah. and everything coming in. Um, and the the one thing that I did like that they didn't do, and I liked this. Yeah. And you may have seen this in other movies and things like that, especially the animated ones. Mm -hmm. They usually, when you look at the shot, you can tell the rocks that are going to be immovable and aren't going to move. Yeah. And then you can tell the ones that will. That doesn't happen so much here. So when she tumbles, it's as much a surprise to us as it is to her, as it is to everybody, as it is to the dwarves and the animals. Yeah. Because the rock didn't look as if it was going to fall. It until, looks as if she was going to successfully push the boulder down the hill to them. Until the lightning, until the lightning bolt struck. Yeah. And it's, then, of course, the vultures are there the whole time. And, and, and like, I said, like I said earlier, brilliant foreshadowing. They're like, ooh, excellent person dead. It's time to eat. Hey, Bob. Bob, KFC's here. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know what is really funny is um, Disney vultures and rain because you may have these creepy ass vultures here. Yeah. And then you look at the Jungle Book and you've got the Bee Gees. <laughs> like, you know that we are your friends. <laughs> we are your friends. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's just like, so So they went from, like, extreme fear. They went from so terrifying that even death himself would go, mm, no, thank you, not today. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and then we have these, like, cheerful, lucky, happy-go-lucky. And that's the thing. That's what I'm saying about how this movie was so sinister at times. Yeah. Because they could have made those vultures slightly less terrifying, but they were like, nope, got to be scary. Just going to go, boom, in your face. Sinister. These things are evil. Do not mess with them. Yeah, these are evil. You see, they in fact they're scary. 
Um, and the fact as well that the vultures aren't frightened of her. Yeah. The other animals are. The crow that her is like her BFF. He was absolutely terrified beyond all sense of reason. The vultures aren't now. They're just like, mm hmm. All right. Yeah. She looks tasty, doesn't she, Bob? Yeah, she looks pretty tasty, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. The, do you know what else? They smile. They smile. Yeah. Is, like is, you look at them, they actually smile. Yeah. And that is terrifying me on all the Yeah. Like, oh, scary vultures, and just the you know the scream when she falls. Yeah. And again, the fact that we don't see her fall. Like we see the beginning of the fall, we but we don't. We don't fall. see the end. No. We don't see the final outcome. No. Incidentally, they did the exact same thing with Gaston and Beauty and the Beast. In fact, the screen was near enough the same. <clears throat> but but the thing is, from an animation point of view, from that one, uh, you actually, if you actually pause it at just the right moment, you can actually see skull and crossbones in his eyes. Uh -huh. Crazy subtle, yeah. very small subtle thing. Yeah. But she was. We were surprised. They were surprised. Yeah. She was surprised. Everybody was surprised that this happened because it was just like, oh well, you know. Um, the only people, the only people, the only things that were not surprised by the fact that she took a tumble and died was the vultures. Yeah. And they were just like, yep, yeah, that's it. You know, just got to wait for the food to cook. But you know, here it is. It's done now. Bing! Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Let's go have some scran. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And you know what else I really liked? And this is a staple of the early ones. Yeah. It's the storybook element of it. So I didn't talk about, we didn't mention that. At the beginning, it's a storybook. At the end of it, it's a yes. storybook. Yes. As she takes the tumble, this, yeah. it's still the storybook. We see the storybook pages again. Yeah. When she put into the, when she puts the glass coffin. And in actual yeah. fact, I only noticed this when I watched it back yesterday or the day before. Yeah. But the glass coffin that she's in, the wood panel bit, they've carved her name into the wood. Yeah. They carved the, the full name Snow White into the wood. How's about Although, that? Thinking about it, realistically, the fact that she hasn't started to decompose at all maybe should be a hint. Hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna say that. Yeah. But <laughs> um but yeah, and then I was like uh uh, last last gripe regarding last gripe regarding the film. It's um you hear, uh there's uh one of the paragraphs is that the prince knows where Snow White is. How does he know where she is? I don't know. Maybe maybe the whole story became a legend. Like that's the only thing I can think of. Is it became a legend? It was spread throughout the land. And part oh. of that was where she actually was. So he's just like, hell yeah, I can go find her. Although these early princes are very, very interesting with the fact that just like, oh, you know what? I'm a kisser. That'll make everything better. <laughs> like, yeah. Just do it. Big bad. Just like, hell yeah. Mwah. There you go. Yay. It's all good. Although I do have to say that last shot with the prince standing when she's on the horse and we see the castle, that is beautiful. That yeah. is like, that, is like it, that, that shot, that screams heavenly to me. Like, that's what that does. It's just so beautifully animated. It's such a wonderful shot. The whole thing is just gorgeous. The paintwork, the colouring, everything yeah. is just absolutely wonderful. Um, and another thing I liked about the storybook pages is, is you get a sense of the passage of time because of the trees and the leaves and the yeah. blossoms and all these sorts of things. And that was that was really really good um, and very very beautiful and lovely and it kind of tied in with, with yeah. everything. Um, you know the fact that the dwarfs were so attentive to her mm -hmm. and it actually specifies that they couldn't bear the thought of burying her. Exactly. Because if you remember, the queen when she was going through a transformation was gleeful beyond belief at the fact that they were going to bury her alive. She actually says that. Yeah. That bury her alone. Um, and the fact that they don't do that again, this is just this is more of a, as well the fact that she the queen didn't know everything. Mm -hmm. She didn't she couldn't understand other people and their motivations and the way they would do things because the dwarves never even thought of burying her. They didn't want to. They couldn't bear the thought of it. Absolutely. Um, but again, yes, yeah, she literally says, "Watch your back." She literally says, "They'll bury her alive." Yeah. 
and she actually goes, oh, I'm buried alive. You know, she and, and then maniacal laugh after that. And you're just like, yeah, this yeah. is not going to end well. Yeah, no. Uh, but that was just all of that there together. And the fact that it tied in so well with her having said that and the fact that they specify in the pages that they didn't. They couldn't, they couldn't find it in their hearts to bury her. Yeah. They couldn't, they couldn't find it in the hearts to bury her. They thought, we can't bury her. Yeah. We can't do it. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Continue. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, watching it, watching it back on Tuesday, um, just that that ending scene when she's saying goodbye to everybody, I was sitting there almost in tears. Oh, I know it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, and a lovely ending. Absolutely. Like a lovely ending, and it feels like a natural ending as well. Yeah. And. It is the fact that even though Snow has gone through all of that, like an attempt on her life twice and all these yeah. sorts of things, she 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 doesn't change who she is as a person. She she remains the same, yeah. despite the trauma that she's gone through. And this is the whole thing: teaching our children to have fortitude and strength to be able to deal yeah. with all these sorts of things happening in their life. Yeah. But yeah, beautiful shot, absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. The closing of the storybook, absolutely yeah. amazing. And again, they use the storybook several times. The used storybook for Snow White, the used mm -hmm. storybook for Robin Hood, Sleeping Beauty, Sword in the Stone. You know, they used the storybook yeah. quite a lot. And yeah. I like the use of the storybook, especially, mm -hmm. and it was so appropriate for Snow White because Snow White was a fairy tale. Exactly. It was in a book. Yeah. So it made sense. It was wonderful. So, yeah, there we go, folks. Uh, that's uh, that's the review out of the way. Uh, so, yeah. Um, my final scores, the scores uh, the scores for each category are out of 10, and then, uh, just doing the math, uh, an overall percentage from the five categories. The story, I gave a 10. The mm. characters, I gave a 9. The visuals, I gave a 10. The soundtrack, I gave a 9. Because um, a couple of... Because uh, I felt that a majority of the songs were in... Like the first half of the film, I felt they could have been more spaced out. Uh, well, like, yes and yes and no, mm -hmm. because the last part of it becomes really, really scary, and it's not really appropriate for there to be it would, song. It there. does that does that does make sense. Now you mentioned that, yeah. Um, yeah, so because the, the whole mm -hmm. point of this movie and what's so good about it is the songs feel so natural. Yeah, and of course they have a bit where they dance and sing together. You know, yeah. all of that feels so natural. So when yeah. we've got this bit and we know what's coming, mm -hmm. having a song randomly thrown in there wouldn't actually do much more, and it wouldn't feel natural. Yeah, if if anything that Just could, to me. That's if cool. if anything from your perspective based on that, that could have knocked the soundtrack section down to an eight possibly. Yeah, yeah, I don't I don't feel that there should have been, and there wasn't, obviously, but I don't feel that there should have been a song at the end. Yep. Um, in that last part, I don't feel it was very appropriate, and it would have felt more like a just throw it in because, rather than an actual, you know, Rather than thing. a reason for it, yeah. And yeah, then, yeah, and then the last section, Test of Time or Legacy, oh, that, well, that, 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 had, that had to be a 10, because it's, we've said, we've said it, we've said it. A couple of times before, this was the start of what Disney would become. Yeah, and then this was the this was the kicked it off, and and as I said, the important thing about the long longevity and the legacy is yeah. the fact that it didn't just influence what was happening with Disney; it influenced the world over. And yeah. people, when they think of Snow White, they don't think of a book or a story in a book. They, they think, think of, of the of Disney film, that movie. Yeah. And even when they're doing like different adaptations of Snow White in various places, they yeah. think of the movie, and the movie is is part of it and, and mm -hmm. used as part of it. Um, I mean, I saw an absolutely gorgeous um, ballet of uh, Snow White, okay. and it twisted the trope around a few bits, and it changed the relationship between Snow and the stepmother because the evil queen was actually yeah. a good queen, and she was Snow's mother, ah. which made it even worse. <laughs> Um, oh my! Like, yeah, yeah. Oh no, 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 no. It gets even worse. She eats the heart. Like she literally eats the heart in the ballet. Okay then. 
Yeah, but the thing that kind of ties in with that with with that adaptation of Snow White was like the visual of how Snow White looks. Yeah, and the bit with the dwarves and how mm-hmm. they were and the lanterns that they chose to use and the yeah. dicks and everything. It all came from that. It all came from that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and again, you know, all the costumes and everything that came along with it, and mm-hmm. just just the, what a princess, what a Disney princess, yeah, became was modelled, as I mentioned before, around Snow, because she was the first. Cinderella was modelled around Snow. Um, the whole thing of they can talk to animals and they can sing and they're gracious and they're lovely. It all mm-hmm. came from Snow, and it was like it was it was a it was a blueprint for the princesses that followed. Yeah. And it was only in the it was only really round about I would say the eighties that that began to change. But for so many years, it was. That was that was it. You yeah. know, Snow was the model for the princesses. Absolutely. Um, what a princess should be. And again, mm-hmm. longevity is just unbelievable. Yeah. There's still adaptations and stuff of Snow White being done to this day. Absolutely. Look at Once Upon a Time. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's still there. It's still being done. And mm-hmm. children still continue to enjoy it. I know that when this quarantine is over, I will be going round to my friend's house mm-hmm. and my nephew and I will be sitting and watching Snow White together. I'll be introducing him to all of this. That's that's brilliant. I'll say, I mean, that's what I'm going to be doing uh, when I decide to have... Um... Uh, kids of my own that I'll be introducing them to these uh, Disney films yeah but uh, at the end of the day um, 10 9 10 um, 10 9 10 9 10 so that was the scores converting that into percentage 96 percent for Snow White I mean great starting point I mean I mean, 96 percent i mean that is absolutely fresh according to the rotten tomatoes meter <laughs> yeah i was just about to say that yeah <laughs> yeah but uh, anyway that is anyway that is it for this first episode of kingdom of isolation um so yeah um so yeah each week we'll be talking about a disney film and uh, we'll be isolating ourselves in the magic of disney i'm gonna have a brand new i'm gonna have a new guest with me next week talking about pinocchio and it's um it's a friend who is just so positive despite what they've um despite what they've uh, been through but nevertheless b thanks very much for joining me for this very first episode i'm pretty sure i'll get you back on board for a future review Oh, honey, yes, please. Um, I am there for it. Um, I'll just sign up right now for Beauty and the Beast and Hercules. I'm just going to jump in there. I, <laughs> I will make... I will make... Actually, I will take note of that just now. <laughs> um, oh, oh, also, just a quick thing here. Um, mm-hmm. uh, eight o'clock tonight, everybody's going to be doing a big clap for the NHS because everyone's so amazing and they're trying to make sure we don't die. So, <laughs> yeah. And as I said, and of course, bearing in mind, folks, this video will be up. Um, this this video will go up onto my channel. Um, it will be up on my YouTube channel after all that has um, has happened. Um, but yeah, um, we're recording this before the um, the eight o'clock applause thing. Uh, but yeah, uh, but like I say, B, thanks very much for uh, for joining me, and uh, we'll and. Uh, Thanks very much to all you guys watching uh, at home. If you enjoyed what if you enjoyed what you um, uh, what you saw, you can hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be a dream chaser or Disney fan like us, uh, you can hit the subscribe button uh, down the bottom of my channel and uh, click the bell to join the Dream Chasers notification squad, so that way you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Uh, I'm gonna have more Ori and the Will of the Wisps up on my channel uh, later this week. Um, and of course, there's still time for you guys to enter the giveaway that I've got uh, going on my channel right now, where you can win a copy of Ori and the Will of the Wisps. All you need to do is, in my playthrough of Ori and the Will of the Wisps, all you need to do is leave Ori in the comments, and you could be within a chance of winning a copy of the game. But nevertheless, that's uh, that's our time in the Kingdom of Isolation done for this week. Next week, we're going to be ch- we're going to be tackling Pinocchio. So, from the two of us. Good night, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Stay safe. Bye.